Amen. Chapter 2, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book of what's called the Torah, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And it's the last one written by Moses about 1500 B.C. Moses is about 120 years of age. 40 years in the universities of Egypt, 40 years in the backside of the desert, just him a crackling fire and the Lord. And now this uh, latest 40 years, he's been leading two to three million people through the wilderness. And if you remember, God had taken them from Egypt to Mount Sinai. And then Moses on Mount Sinai gets the Ten Commandments, comes down. The golden calf thing, he breaks those tablets. He goes back up, gets a second set of law. He comes back down. There's the commandments that we're somewhat familiar with, but also the blueprints of a tabernacle. So they built that. So from Egypt to Mount Sinai to building all of the tabernacle and all the elements therein, training the priests, and then God says, okay, you guys, you ready? Let's head up north. And so they go up to Kadesh Barnea, and they're on the east side of the Jordan River, and they're looking across, and they see Jericho. Somebody had a bright idea. I know. Jericho? Let's don't go through Jericho. That's the strongest fortress in all of the land of the Canaanites. Let's go down to the south, come in the back door, and let's send in 12 spies. Two of them came back, Joshua and Caleb, no problem. The other 10 came back with what? <laughs> Can't do it. One of the things I want you to be sensitive to tonight in chapter 2, giants are in the land, you know, and they speak of what are called the Anakim. And we think, oh, what a quaint notion. So they were probably what? Maybe over six feet tall. You know, maybe that's the giants. Turns out that uh, they're, they were bigger than that. Some parts of the Bible describe the Anakim. One of them, a gentleman, I can't think of his name, who's actually mentioned, he had a big old long bed, about 13 feet long. Uh, Goliath was likely either part of the Anakim or, as we're going to see tonight, did you know that there were other giants in the land too? We'll get to those tonight. We can't do it. We can't do it. We quit. So from Egypt to Sinai, build the tabernacle, head up to Kadesh Barnea, and no thanks, we're not going in. That was about two years. And then 38 years from, <laughs> we can't make it. God says this group is just sort of replete with fear. Fear is very contagious. And when these 10 spies came back and said, we're all going to die, turns out that most of the people believed them. So for the next 38 years, that's when they're going to be wandering around. We're at the end of that 38 years now. So two years from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea plus 38 years wandering is a total of 40 years. So the colloquial term is they wandered in the desert for 40 years, but now you are a little more um, informed and come to find out it's 2 plus 38, and that's important here in a second. So that's where we're at. So we're about to enter the promised land. 40 years from Egypt, Moses continues the history lesson. Last chapter, he left off in his recounting of your fathers. Remember, 20 years of age and older, you're going to die in that next 38 years of wandering. So this is a new crowd. These are the sons and the daughters of that first crowd. That's why Moses is going over them again. Why does Moses, pardon me, why does God have Moses recount Israel's dubious, unfaithful, and rebellious history? Why does he do that? I know, Lord, I know, I know. Maybe because Winston Churchill, who was actually citing Spanish philosopher um, uh, George Santanea, he once said it this way, those who will not learn from history are destined to repeat it. All right, chapter 2, verse 1. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness. Remember that, you guys? Actually, you, they wouldn't. Their fathers did. We then journeyed into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me. And we skirted Mount Seir. That's in the southern regions. It's south of the Dead Sea for many days. Verse 2. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward. Head up to Kadesh Barnea. You guys are about to head into the Promised Land. Verse 4. 
and command the people saying, you are about to pass through the territory of your brethren, kind of distant cousins, because remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. The oldest was Esau. But the Bible says that Esau, he hated his birthright. What does that mean? He really didn't care about the God of Abraham and his own father, Isaac. He really didn't care. Jacob did care. He was the younger one. And then you know the whole story that um, there's Esau, and he comes in from a hunt, and, and he's like, I'm famished. And, and uh, what are you cooking, little bro? And bro says, some lentil soup. And then he was very hungry, was Esau. I'll tell you what, I'm the firstborn. I will sell you my firstborn stuff if I can have a bowl of that soup. Is that a very good deal? That just shows you Esau could care, couldn't care less about the glorious inheritance, really the love of Jehovah the Father. He didn't care. So Esau, he then gets mad eventually when Jacob does give, or transposes the firstborn, the rights of the firstborn to Jacob. Esau, now he's all sour grapes. I wanted that. Oh, really? Seriously? Mom says, Jacob, you better split town. You better head over to my brother, Laban, for where I'm from, and chill until your brother is not mad at you. 20 years transpire, and he comes back. So this is their, their uh, people or their brothers, the descendants of Esau and then the descendants of Jacob. The two, three million Jews that have come up out of Egypt come from Jacob. There were people that were still left behind in that region. Those were the descendants of Esau. Collectively, they're called the Edomites. You have skirted this mountain long enough, you guys, Israel, and command the people saying, you are about to pass through the territory of your brethren. Those are the Esau side of the family. The descendants of Esau. Uh, this would be the area that the Bible describes as Edom, but also Moab. And this is roughly where Petra is. You can check that out in Genesis 38, verses 8 and 9. Well, anyway, they live there in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Do not meddle with them. Respect them. For I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as one footstep. Because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. I have given it to Esau as a possession. If you will, I've promised it to him. Now, this is interesting. I have promised Esau, you have this land. Now, loosely stated, did God give Abraham and his descendants the land that we're about to enter into? Yes, we call that the promised land. Turns out there is another promised land, land promised to Esau. Uh, hold your finger here. Join me in the Old Testament book of Malachi. Old Testament book of Malachi. Where'd you go, Mr. Malachi? There you are. Malachi. The last Old Testament book. Malachi chapter one, please. I did not know this, but there is another promised land. <laughs> Isn't it fascinating that God is the creative one? And Lucifer is not particularly creative. Perhaps he doesn't have to be. I don't know. But God is a great, or Lucifer is a great counterfeiter. He has counterfeited the promised land. Check it out. We're in Malachi chapter 1, please. And chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Why? Esau turns out to be a terrible, terrible person. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16 says that Esau was wicked, profane and despised his birthright, which is to say he despised God. Continuing with verse three, Esau I have hated 
and laid waste his mountains and his heritage. Who laid waste to um, Esau's land? God did. For the jackals of the wilderness, and even though Edom has said, that's Esau, and even though they may say, hey, we've made some progress. We have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. And thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Back to the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> what? What's going on here is this. Esau was Jacob's brother. He was a wicked, profane fella. We just saw in Malachi chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, that says that Esau's possession was exactly what Esau wanted. What do you mean? Jacob wanted the promised land promised to his grandfather Abraham, which is to say the God of Abraham and Isaac. Did Esau want the God of his grandfather? No, he didn't. I want a land without God. And you know what God gives him? Exactly that. And keep that Malachi chapter 1 verses 3, 4, and 5 in mind. I see to it that it stays desolate. And about the time he thinks that through his own ingenuity he's going to make some stuff happen, you know, I'll knock it back down. Wow, God. Wow. Malachi 1 verse 4 and 5 says, When Esau, Edom, does make any progress, I will destroy it again and again and again. Did you know that uh, Psalm 60 verse 8 says, quote, Moab, which is this region, is my wash pot. <laughs> you know what a wash pot is? It's a chamber pot. Do you know what a chamber pot is? In the old days, before there was indoor <clears throat> plumbing, where did folks go to go and relieve themselves? To the outhouse. What if it was too cold and didn't want to go outside? You kept a little pot in your, in your boudoir and you went into the chamber pot, wash pot. Moab is my porta potty. And over Edom, I will cast my shoe, which is a polite way of saying, wipe my feet. Oh my Lord, what are you doing? Wow, God, I thought you were a God of mercy and a sloppy agape. Esau is a model, like everything in the scripture. Esau is a model of anyone refusing to live in God's house, heart, or mind. Esau's a model for everyone refusing God's grace, hating God's free gifts, blessings, and salvation. Edom and Moab, dry, hot, it's a thirsty, thirsty land, and constant destruction is a model of hell. Wow. I didn't know that until doing this particular study this week. There's the promised land. What's that filled with? Flowing with milk and honey. Fruit. If the people of God, Deuteronomy 28, if the people of God do what they're supposed to do, what is God going to do? He's going to protect them supernaturally. Your enemy will, may come in one way, but he's going to scatter seven. I'm going to make sure that your children are safe that your cities are safe, that your rural areas are safe. I'm going to put a hedge about you, and you will be fruitful, and everybody around you are going to say, whoa, who is your God that you are prospering to this fashion? That's the promised land. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's full of fruit. Did you know that there is another land of promise? modeled by Esau. And then we're going to see here in a minute also the daughters of Lot. Now, do you remember the story of Lot? Lot, for some reason, says the apostle Peter, Lot was a righteous guy. Now, what that means is somehow, some way, God accounted to him righteousness. 
he's, if you will, saved and we will see him in heaven. I don't know how that's possible because as you look through his antics, you're going to find out he was anything but faithful. But it would seem, says the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Peter says he was living in Sodom and Gomorrah, but it vexed his righteous soul. If you're really born again, should you be living in Sodom? Just a thought. No, but are there some actually born again Christians who choose to live in a region and among people that they should not be living in and among? Well, if you do that, you're going to be forced with some really tough choices. And that was Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. And so then the angel comes to destroy, judge the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. But he cannot because there's one righteous guy there. Uh, by the way, for you trying to figure out the rapture, um, there are plenty of models, but Lot is one of them. Is Sodom and Gomorrah going to get judged by God with fire and brimstone? Did the angel say, we can't start that process because you're there? I can't start the destruction until we take you out. That is a model of the rapture. We cannot judge if there is one righteous person. So, question, did Lot go out before the judgment, at the midpoint of the judgment, or at the end of the judgment? He went out before. Now remember, if it's important in the Bible, there's going to be some Old Testament models. That's just one. There are a bunch more. Anyway, that parenthetically. Now what happens? Mrs. Lot looks back, not just like glances, the Bible kind of constructs that sentence as she longed, oh, my Walmarts and my internet and all that kind of stuff. My Sodom, my Sodom. <laughs> and God says, really? It's a pillar of salt. Two daughters travel with Lot. They see this tremendous destruction that comes from the heavenlies, fire and brimstone. It would appear that they thought that the entire planet was wiped out, it seems. So they don't have a husband, so they don't have any kids, and so they hatch a terrible plan. Let's get Dad Lot drunk, and we will sleep with him. And they did, both of them. And there are two terribly illegitimate children because of that terrible, terrible situation. Well, the oldest one, that was Moab, and that's what this area is named after. The younger daughter has a son and names him Ammon. Ammon, Jordan, the capital of Jordan, the state of Jordan, is named after Ammon. With your prophetic glasses on, is stuff going to heat up in the Middle East sometime soon? It surely is. And the book of Obadiah is all about what God is going to do to Edom, and there's reasons for that. But back to our study here, did you know that there is a promised land, or I should say land promised to Esau, Edom? Hey, what's it like? It's awful. And, and whenever the people kind of pick themselves up by their bootstraps and let's make some advance, God makes sure that it stays in destruction. Oh, and there's the daughters of Lot, Ammon and Moab. And they all live in the same general neighborhood. That's important for our study. All right. Um, but this is fascinating. Hey, wow, God, I thought you were God of mercy and sloppy agape. Esau, he wanted a whole land without God. And boy, did God give it to him. In the book of Malachi, we have a bit of an insight. God says, I make sure it stays a terrible, destructive desert. And they love living there. Looks pretty silly on Esau and Moab and those guys, but um, does that ever kind of, does your old sin ever come knocking on your door again? Hey, how about we get back to the old days? That's saying, hey, you want to come back to that other promised land? There's some promises there too. Uh, verse six. You shall buy food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. 
For the Lord your God, verse 7, has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're trudging through this great wilderness these 40 years. Remember, first two from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea. And the last 38, total of 40. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you and you have lacked nothing. Esau hates God. Everything he puts his hand to equals destruction. Israel, if you will, Jacob, even though they do blow it over and over, do they have a promised land? But look at this. God says, God responds with grace after grace and blessing after blessing. Which promised land y'all want to be in? Verse 8. And when we pass beyond our brethren, the descendants of Esau who dwell in Seir, Mount Seir, away from the road of the plain, away from Elath and Ezion Geber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Moab is the eldest son of Lot's oldest daughter, Moab. Then, verse 9, the Lord said to me, do not harass Moab either. And that whole story of that terrible uh, Lot thing, you can check that out in Genesis 19. Ew. <laughs> Nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession. Why? Because it's awful land. Because I have given Ar, which is a city evidently in Moab, to the descendants of Lot as a possession. So the Edomites descend from Esau. The Moabites descend from Lot's incestuous daughters. Verse 10. Now, by the way, this next little section, most scholars regard as probably something that Moses did not write but probably a copyist of some kind. That's why you have it in parentheses in your Bible. Um, this may not be from Moses' own hand, this next little section. The Emim who had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. So there were more giants in the land than just the Anakim? Yep, there were the Emim. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Emim. Emim means terror. It's very likely that these were, well, if Goliath is any indication, Goliath, depending on what measure of cubit you use, Goliath was at least 10 feet tall, likely 12 feet tall. Some people say, well, yeah, because we're looking through modern lenses, there's no way anybody can be that tall. Pretty sure the tallest human who has ever lived on record, I, I was going to look up that statistic, I forgot to do so, but I can't think of his name, but there's a picture of him in the 1935, and he's standing next to a Chevy, and two normal-sized human beings come up to his belt. And I want to say he was 8 foot 10, but I'm probably mis misspoken. The point of it is, I don't, I'm not aware of any official human that has measured nine feet. The Bible says very clearly that Goliath was at least ten and maybe lar larger. So some people say, well, that can't be. The Bible obviously doesn't know what it's talking about. We know what it is. It's a form of gigantism, which this fella, this eight-foot-plus fella, had. It's a disease of the pituitary and some of the endocrine system, and your body just never stops growing. These all die at a relatively young age because the human body becomes out of balance at that size, and so they can't barely walk. They need canes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I have actually heard it preached one from a message from a pastor in this community, who said, "Yeah." Goliath was actually a gigantism fella, but he was really weak. He was so weak that he had to have an armor bearer with him. So he was really weak. What does the Bible say about Goliath? Was he weak? He roared, where is the champion of the Israelites? Send him out to me. And Israel's giant, Saul, <laughs> shaking in his boots. Would you be afraid of a rickety old gigantism a sufferer with arthritis and canes? Nobody dared go out and meet Goliath except a young man by the name of David who had in his pocket the first guided missile in history. 
Fascinating. So did you know that there are more than the Anakim? The Emim, the terrors. Verse 12. And then you have the Orites, formerly dwelt in Seir, but the descendants of Esau dispossessed them. Really? They were giants too. And destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their place. Just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. And that's when I wrote my Bible. Fascinating. What we have here is a counterfeit promised land. Israel's promised land, God's people, it flows with fruit. Supernatural blessing and protection. Check it out. Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1 through 14. God rejecting people have a promised land too. It flows with idolatry, sexual debauchery and disease and constant strife and destruction. Come on, Pastor Steve, are you sure? Right? Malachi 1, verses 3 through 5 says so. Which promised land do I want to be a part of? Also, this is important too. God's people, I don't know if you've noticed, i got to say this delicately, Blake. God's people can at times be whiners. Just saying, I can be a whiner myself. It's too hard. God, aren't you watching? Numbers chapter 13, some of the giants, remember they came back, they said, we can't go in there because there's giants in the land. Some of those giants were these giants. Did you know that those giants, in the case of the Emem and the Orites, were giants too? Those are probably some of the giant humans that the ten spies complained about. Notice that Esau's boys whooped them. Think this one through with me. Sometimes God's people can be whiners. <laughs> it's too hard. God, aren't you watching? Hey, Numbers chapter 13, when the ten spies came back, some of the giants they were described were these guys. Notice, please, God's people complained, rebelled, and didn't even try. God-haters, Edom and Moab, defeated them. Fascinating. See, non-saved, rebellious God-haters, they have giants too. <laughs> Sometimes Christians can be kind of whiners and you need to know something that God says everybody has giants. What's the difference? Oh, it's a big difference. The rebellious go through their own trials and tribulations without God, of course. But then don't forget Malachi chapter 1. Any victories are quickly swallowed up by more destruction. Then at the end... Death and destruction under the sun. Did you know that they're going to end up in their own promised land? Modeled. It's a model of hell. Fire, dryness, injury, and destruction. Now God's people, they go through trials and tribulations too. And in the process, what are we supposed to be doing? Learning. Growing. A greater and greater love for the God who saved us. And the end of that process... We should be in the spirit-filled land of fruit and supernatural protection and blessing. How many of you are a little surprised by the fact that there's another promised land? It's the anti-promised land. Verse 13. Now rise and cross over the valley of, of Zerid. Remember, Moses is recounting what they did. We caught up on all this when we were studying right around Numbers chapter 21 and following. This is Moses recounting for these young people. So we crossed over the valley of Zered, verse 14, and the, and the time we took to come from Kadesh Barnea, that's opposite um, Jericho, and they balked. The time it took for us to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of Zered was 38 years. So remember, Egypt to Mount uh, Sinai, Build the temple. Let's head up to Kadesh Barnea. Ready to head in, boys? Eek, there's giants in the land. That's two years. Now start counting. 38 years later. If you would, would you highlight this? 38 years and write John chapter 5, verse 5. In fact, let's turn there. John, Gospel of John, 
chapter 5. This is going to make sense of this passage here. John chapter 5, please. Let's go to um, John chapter 5. There we are, chapter 5. Let's start with verse 1. Now after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It's Passover. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. And it had five porches. In these lay a great number, a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed. That's not a very healthy crowd, is it? Waiting for the moving of the water. Now this next little section, this is what you call an urban myth. Nowhere in the Bible does the Bible say, hey, go down next to a pool, and when the angel shows up and makes it into a sudden jacuzzi, jump on in. And if you're first, you get healed. That is nowhere in the scriptures. This is an urban myth, okay? But uh, if you're desperate enough, you will cling to an urban myth with quite a grasp. Blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4, here's the myth. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. That was the urban myth. Now watch this, verse 5. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity of how many years? 38 years. Now whenever the Bible gives you a specific detail, perk up and listen. Now in here, right in your margin, Deuteronomy 2, verse 14. Question. Why did Israel wander for 38 years? Because of their sin and their rebellion. And they had no faith in God. They were blind, lame, and paralyzed for 38 years. What is God saying with this one mention of 38 years? This whole thing being played out by Jesus to this man, 38 years. All of Israel should have went 38 years, 30, oh yeah! That's how long that we were knuckleheads and missed God's promise. This is your gospel writer, John, saying, and, and Jesus um, putting this whole thing together, somebody was supposed to say, wait a minute, this whole crowd of lame, blind, and paralyzed, believing stupid things is Israel right now, isn't it, Jesus? Jesus would have went, yes. Look what happens. Verse 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years, Deuteronomy 2, verse 14. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he, had, that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Is that a relatively simple question? Shouldn't that have a relatively simple response? Now watch what the guy does. Now verse 7, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another man steps down before me. I think this went through. <laughs> How's that working for you? 38 years. How silly does this lame man look? Wait a minute. You've been trying to get to the pool. You are lame after all. And you're willing to sit by a terrible urban myth for 38 years. And when the great physician himself shows up, you want to get out of that rut? Do you want to be healed? The man, if you will, Jesus glasses on, Israel is saying to her great physician, no. We want to stay deaf, blind, and paralyzed. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Fascinating, right? You see how your Bible dovetails together? By the way, there are people who claim that the Bible was concocted by humans. Now, humans wrote it down, but as they were given inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 
This little sort of connection, 38 years and all that that means, now that you know, in Deuteronomy 2, and then explains John chapter 5, verse 5. How many of you know that no humans could have figured that one out? Back to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 2, verse 14. So we crossed over the valley of Zerid 38 years until all the generation of men of war, 20 years in age and older, which I believe also is likely an indicator of the age of accountability. When a child dies or someone with a um, significant uh, mental incapacity, God is never going to send someone into hell who didn't have full facility to make a conscious choice. Before you're probably around age 20, thereabouts, God says you don't have the computer yet formed in your mind. So people who die, I believe, under the age of 20, probably, very likely, I think there's strong evidence, that is the age of accountability, it would seem. And so there are times when God has people, God has Joshua, as we'll see in the book of Joshua. I want you to judge this group of people and I want them all to be killed. The the elders, the adults, and the children. And at first glance, you're like, wow, that seems harsh. But think it through with me with the Lord. That doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you do a little research on who those people were, and more and more archaeology has come to the surface. These were horrific cultures. And a little baby, you know, um, up to two, three, four, five years old, how cute are humans in that condition? As a rule, they're still fairly innocent. But you leave a little one like that in a society that is that evil and debauched, good chance that that little innocent one is going to grow up to do what? Pretty much what the culture is doing. Do you see that God in his mercy will say, no more? I will not let one more generation be born to this debauched group grooming someone for hell. Let's continue our story. Until all that generation of the men of war was consumed, I believe the age of accountability, roughly around age 20, from the camp, just as the Lord had sworn them, verse 15, for indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the midst of the camp until they were consumed. All right, so Egypt to Sinai, Moses builds the tabernacle and the elements. Now go to Par Kadesh Barnea. They did two years. Ten spies, <laughs> no way, God. So now the huge Kadesh failure to Joshua, which Moses is about to hand the car keys to Joshua, is 38 years. These 38 years represent God's people wandering in the desert because they would not believe what God was doing. That's why Jesus mentions, and the gospel mentions, the dude at Bethesda was stuck in an urban myth and he was blind and lame 38 years. That explains John chapter 5, verse 5. All right. Hey, Israel, do you want to be made well? Verse 16. So it was when all the men of war had finally perished from among the people that the Lord spoke to me saying, Verse 18, this day you are to cross over at Ar, the boundary of Moab. And when you come near the people of Ammon, do not harass them or meddle with them. For I, I will not give you any of that land of the people of Ammon either as a possession. Because I have given it to the descendants of Lot. Those are the Moabite people as a possession. So they have a promised land too. Verse 20. That was also regarded as a land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there. Uh, but the Ammonites called them Zemzumimim. And that means plotter or trickster. Interesting. A people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them. And they, the Ammonites, dispossessed them and dwelt in their place, verse 22, just as he had done to the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, who dwelt in Seir, when he, God, this is important, he, God, destroyed the Orites from before them. Wait a minute, chapter, verse 12, I thought the descendants of Esau did that. 
They, the Ammonites, dispossessed them and dwelt in their place even to this day. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Verse 12 says that Esau's descendants won the victory. Here, was it really the humans? No, it was whom? It was God. God said, I did that. Um, it's the same for all self-made people. I don't believe your God. I don't need your God. I got college educated. Um, I keep on top of all the trends. I'm really smart. And by virtue of my own cunning and my own um, abilities and computer prowess, I'm a billionaire, says Elon Musk says many of the people, uh, maybe it was um, the last couple of decades, of course, it was, um, who was the Microsoft guy? I can't think of his name all of a sudden. Bill Gates, you know, Donald Trump, whoever it might be. I'm a self-made man. Was it the Amorites who actually defeated those giants? What did this verse say? It was God that did that. So much for a self-made man. King Cyrus, remember, was quite a king. What was it, about 500 or so B.C.? He rolled in and took over Babylon. Look what I've done. He is so huge that even to this day, they celebrate um, his, his uh, kingship on um, King Cyrus Day. He thought he was all that in a bag of chips. Today, Joseph Kennedy, Elon Musk, any victory is really because of God. Foolish is the man who, may, who takes credit for his success. Amen, you guys? What's our job then? So we just stay home and God has to do it? No. But God says, uh, get busy. Um, you can't steer a ship if it's not moving. Our job, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Word, worship, prayer, and fellowship every day. Then get to work. Go to get your job. Live your life. Work diligently with integrity as unto the Lord. He'll, he will guide your steps. Me sometimes, though, I'm, yeah, harumph. I found myself getting a little harumphed even uh, recently. <sighs> Shoulders droop. Perspective narrows. I become kind of a Spiritual navel gazer. Me? Harumph. I didn't get that promotion. My business just got audited. My ministry hasn't happened. Good time to remember this, you guys. You might want to write that down. It's a good one. Psalm 84, verse 11. Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. It's going to give you light when you need it. Shade when you need that too. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. And no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Let me rephrase that. James, is it chapter 1, verse 17? Every good and perfect gift comes from Macy's. Everybody knows that. Every good and perfect gift, gift comes from where? Our loving Father of lights. Um, I hate that this is in the Bible, but it's in the Bible, y'all. That thing that you're like, oh, if I only had that! Oh, my, what I find completion. No, you won't. Here's the point. Psalm 84 tells us, if it is good for you, God will not withhold it. But if God does withhold it, it's not... <laughs> Ooh, that was a... It's not what? Good for you. And I'm preaching to myself and the choir if we had one. If it is good for you, God will not withhold it. Amen? Amen? If it is not good for you, even though you're like, <laughs> please, God. If it's not there, you don't have it. Why? Because God hates me. It's because God actually loves you very, very much. And if you don't have the it, whatever that is, it's because at present, it would not be good for you. 
Verse 23. And the Avim, those are other giants. How many giants are we talking about here? That's a bunch of giants. Avim, that means that, that word, that's what they would call their giants. They were called the Avim, and Avim means ruin. And the Avim, the ruined guys, who dwelt in the villages as far as Gaza. Uh, by the way, where is Gaza in the Old Testament? It's where Gaza is today. Fascinating. It used to be a Philistine stronghold. Gaza, the Kaphtorim, who came from Kaphtor, destroyed them and dwelt in their place. So they wiped out their giants too. Let's review. We have the Emims, terror. The Orims, the cave darkness dwellers. The Zimzum Ziminim Ziminimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimim
obedient to God's word. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will, with the temptation, really the test, will also make it the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So whatever you're looking at that seems way over your head, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, no, it's not. But they died. That happened. I was injured so terribly, so deeply betrayed. Surely nobody has ever had a giant like that. What's the answer? Everybody's got giants. God's promise, I will never give you a giant bigger than you can handle. Let me say that again. Whatever is touching your life currently, it seems like it is overwhelming. But according to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, God would not have allowed it to touch your life unless you were ready. Amen. Let's zoom to the end. Verse 24, arise, take your journey, cross over the river Arnon. This is still Moses recounting these guys' as fathers. Look, I have given into your hand Zihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon in his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. This day I will begin to put the, the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven. Who shall hear the report of you? They shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. That will happen, by the way, Numbers chapter 21. Verse 26. And I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with the words of peace, saying, let me pass through your land. So Moses reached out to him and said, we won't take anything we promise. Let us just pass through your land. Uh, two million of us. I will keep strictly to the road. I will neither turn to the right nor to the left. Verse 28. You shall sell it. If we do food, we'll pay for it, um, that I may eat and give you water, and give me water for money that I may drink, only let me pass through on foot. Verse 29. Just as the descendants of Esau who dwell in Seir and the Moabites who dwell in Ar did for me until I crossed the Jordan to the land which the Lord is giving us. But Zihon, king of Ishbon, would not let us pass through. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. That really happened. Because Israel listened to God's word right there in Numbers 21, Moses, nobody of Israel got captured, if you remember that story. All the enemy strongholds, everybody say all, all the enemy strongholds were defeated. Verse 31. And the Lord said to me, see, I have begun to give Sihon and his hand over to you. Begin to possess it and that you may inherit this land. Then Zion and all of his people came out against us to fight us at Jahaz, and the Lord our God delivered him over to us. So we defeated him, his sons and all his people, and we took all of his cities at that time, and we uttered, utterly destroyed the men, women, and the little ones of every city. We left none remaining. As I said, that's actually God's mercy, not letting that group of young people grow up to eventually become people who would be marked for hell. And in your prophetic glasses, this is a model of judgment day, is Mr. Sihon. What do you mean? God sent his word, Moses, if you will, the prophets, and even Jesus himself is saying to everyone, I want to buy your freedom. I want to purchase you from your sin." And many, like Mr. Zion did, say, no, stay out of my stuff. It's mine, all mine. Now, was that land and the water and all the produce, was that really Mr. Zion's sole possession? No, that's God's land. God, it was never yours, Mr. Zion, and people standing before the Lord on Judgment Day. But my stuff, it was never your stuff. Everything you have is by my grace. Your land, your job, your family, the air in your lungs, everyone who stands against God's word long enough will perish. That's the model here. Verse 35. We took only the livestock as plunder for ourselves with the spoil of the cities which we took. From Eror, 
which is on the bank of the river Arnon and from the city that is in the ravine as far as Gilead. There was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all of us. Only you did not go near the land. Only you did not go near the land of the people of Ammon. Anywhere along the river Yabok or to the cities of the mountains or wherever the Lord our God had forbidden us. Because of uh, Mr. Sihon's stubborn heart, war did indeed break out, but they won. And what happens is, is that's where Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh would eventually settle. So Deuteronomy chapter 2 told us that there are several promised lands, but only one is going to result in fruit and family. What's the other one's going to end up with? Moab, my wash pot. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord. Interesting idea, Lord Jesus. Your Bible is so cool. And there it is, a model. And this, it's, like, it's like for us even today. God offers us the same opportunity. Hey, Steve, where do you want to live? Do you want to live in desert and destruction and death? And no matter what you put your hand to, ultimately is going to burn. That's the model for the world. That's the model of Esau and the Moabites. No, God, no. Or, Steve, do you want to live in a land of promise that is flowing with milk and honey, fruit, and supernatural protection and blessing? Lord, I pray, along with anyone within the sound of my voice, that it is such an obvious choice. Get saved. Give my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ who paid for all of my sin. Then ask him to fill me with his Holy Spirit. And then do my very best to word every day, worship every day, pray every day. Get to fellowship whenever I can. And then without even trying, fruit of the promised land will become evident in my marriage, in my business, and when a real curveball comes around the corner, I won't be rattled. Because, Lord, this isn't my business. This is your business. I gave you the steering wheel again. And I trust you. Because when I'm living in the promised land, your promise is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. In Jesus' name and all the promised land dwellers said, Amen. Amen. Amen.